In this video, I'll show you how to write a Python program that simulates the gravitational slingshot effect. Now, this is the effect that happens when spacecrafts get near planets. What happens is they have an existing velocity and acceleration, and then the gravitational pull of that planet, depending on the mass and the distance, actually makes it so they can kind of slingshot around the planet. So there's a lot of famous scenes in movies where they actually use this to their advantage, and this is definitely something that is calculated by the spacecraft and all of the engineers. Really cool simulation, doesn't take that long to build. It's actually not overly complicated, just a few very simple physics equations that I will break down for you. And with that said, let's dive into it after a quick word from our sponsor. Today, I'm sponsoring my own video to tell you about my brand new software development course, which is especially designed to help you land a job. Not only do we teach you all of the skills you need to be a great front end, back end, or DevOps engineer, and you can pick which one you want to be, we also connect you with a network of employers that are looking to hire you as soon as you graduate the course. The reason they do that is because we run you through the best possible curriculum, we test you every step of the way through proctored exams and final capstone projects, and we set up your resume, we help you get interview ready, and employers actually pay us to interview you because they know you're such great candidates. This course is an absolute game changer. I've been working on it for a very long time. And what happens is you'll go through a software development fundamentals course taught by me, and then you'll pick a specialization in front end, back end, or DevOps taught by an industry expert. For example, Kyle from Web Dev Simplified is the front end instructor, and he has a fantastic course which will literally make you the top level candidate for any junior front end position. This is a game changer. I hope you guys like it, and you can check it out from the link in the description. All right, so let's spend a second here breaking down exactly what's going on in this simulation and talking about the steps we need to take to actually code this out. First of all, all of the code for this will be available in the description. So if you don't want to code it out, feel free to just grab that from GitHub. That will also include the different assets that I have here, like the little planet and the space background. Now, the way I've set this up is that we can click the mouse and kind of place an object and then we can choose the launch trajectory and the relative kind of velocity of that object. So we can test this out from many different areas. Now, you'll see that what ends up happening is if I kind of shoot in a straight line here, not really close to the planet, we get very minimal effect and we're pulled slightly to the right. That's because we're kind of far away from the planet and the gravitational pull is not that strong. However, if I'm very close to the planet like this, you can see that I almost immediately get launched right into the center of it. And that's because the gravitational force is very high. You probably learned this in something like a grade 10 physics class. If you didn't, don't worry, I will break down the equations there fairly straightforward. But what we need to do here is make it first of all, so we can launch this little object. That's going to be the first step, launching it in some direction. The second step will be adding this planet and then calculating the force that's being applied to our object as it moves around the planet and gets closer. So that's what we need to do. Again, that's going to involve being able to launch the object, which we'll do first. And then we need to actually adjust the object's velocity uh, and its movement based on the location of the planet and the gravitational force. This will be an intermediate Python tutorial, not anything crazy complicated, but I am going to assume that you have some understanding of Python. With that said, let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so I've just cleared my file here and I'll just kind of start with the setup steps. So for this video, we'll be using Pygame. Now Pygame is a 2D graphics library in Python, great for simple simulations like this. If you wanna learn more about it, you can check out tons of videos on my channel. Don't worry if you don't know it though, I'll explain everything you need in this video, it's quite simple. However, the first thing we need to do is install Pygame. To do that, we'll open up a terminal like the one I have here in VS Code and type pip install and then Pygame. If you're on Mac or Linux, you may need to do pip3 install Pygame. Go ahead and run this. It should install that package for you. Now, many of you have issues with this pip command. If that's the case, I will leave two videos on the screen that will show you how to fix this for both Mac and Linux and to install Pygame on your system. Once we have Pygame installed, that's pretty much all we need to do other than grabbing these two images here. Now, you don't need to use the images, but I'm going to recommend you do because it looks quite a bit nicer. So you can grab these images by clicking the link in the description and downloading them. It should bring you to my website, which will just automatically download the files for you. If you don't trust that link, well, obviously you can trust it, but if for some reason you don't want to click it, then you can just go to GitHub and you can download them from there. All right. So we have an empty Python file here open in VS Code. We have Pygame installed and we're going to start writing some code. First, we're going to import the Pygame module and then we are going to import the math module. We are then going to go down here and initialize the Pygame package or module like that. 
Now, what I like to do is start by setting up a bunch of constant variables that we'll be using throughout the program. They may seem abstract right now, but we'll be referring to them constantly as we go through the rest of the code. So just give me a second here and let's code some of these out. The first thing we need to do is define the width and the height of our window. So we'll say width comma height is equal to 800 comma 600. Now you can adjust this if you want, but this is a pretty standard width and height that should work for pretty much all monitors and devices. Next, we're going to set a window. Now the window is going to be where we draw all of the objects on Pygame. Now this is referred to as a surface, but since this is the window surface, I call it a window. Okay. So we're going to say Pygame dot display dot set underscore mode. And inside of here, we're going to pass a tuple that contains the width and the height of our window. Okay. So what we've just done here is initialized a new Pi game window where we'll be drawing all of our content that contains, uh, or sorry, has a width of 800 and has a height of 600. You can adjust those if you want. Next, we'll just set a caption. This is kind of like the title of the window. And for the caption, we can just say this is going to be a gravitational slingshot effect. And it looks like I spelt all of those words quite incorrectly. So we'll use my <laughs> spell check here. Gravitational. Is that correct? Is that how you spell that? Um, gravitational. There you go. I am apparently not very good at spelling. OK, there you go. Don't roast me in the comments too hard, guys. I'm better at coding than I am at spelling. OK, now that we have the display set up, we'll set up a few constants for the different objects we'll be using, a few colors some stuff like that. And then we'll move on to actually creating the main loop for our program. So we're going to need to have a mass for our objects because the gravitational effect is actually relative to both the distance and the mass. So what we're going to set is first the mass of our planet. I'm going to call this 100. And next, we're going to set the mass of our ship. Now, our ship is just going to be those little objects, uh, the kind of red dots, right? You can make an image if you want for them, but I'm just going to go with the circle for now. So we're going to say the mass of our ships is five. We're going to set a gravitational constant. This is essentially the force of gravity or the effect you're going to feel. So if you want more gravity, you would increase this. If you want less, you would decrease it. And I'm just going to make this five for now. We're then going to set an FPS. This is the frames per second that our simulation is going to run at. I'm going to run this at 60. If you want to speed it up, you increase it. If you want to slow it down, you decrease this. Few more ones we're going to need here. I'm going to say my planet underscore size is going to be 50. So that's going to be the radius of my planet. Uh, we'll leave it as size for right now. And then we're going to have an object size. Same thing, radius of our object. This will be five. Lastly, we're going to have a scale for our velocity, which is going to be equal to 100. You'll see why we need that in one second. OK, so now we have these. Next thing we're going to do is just take these two images here and import them into Pygame so we're able to draw them. I know a lot of setup right now, but in a second, we'll write some code that will use all of these variables. So we're going to say BG standing for background is equal to Pygame dot image dot load. Now, this is how you load an image. Now, if the image is in the same directory as your main Python file, what you'll do is simply write the name of the image. So in this case, it's going to be background dot JPEG. OK, if you're using a different image, make sure you put the corresponding file name here. You can see I have background JPEG. So that's why I'm calling this background dot JPEG. Now, if this was for some reason inside of some folder, say I had something like images here and some images there, I could write images slash background dot JPEG, or I can use something from the OS package, which I'll quickly show you here, which is path dot join. So if you want to join a directory with a file name, you can do OS dot path dot join the directory name and then the file name like this, and it will create that path for you and allow you to load that image. Now, if the image is not in the same directory as this uh, file, you're going to have difficulty loading it. So I recommend just make sure all of your images are in the same root directory where this main Python file is. OK, in this case, it's just a directory on my desktop. OK, we loaded our background. The next thing we need to do is load our planet image. So I'm going to say planet is equal to pygame.image.load. And I'm going to load Jupiter, which is this specific planet dot PNG. Now, the issue here, though, is that when I load these images, you see they're quite large. For example, this background.jpg is actually a 6,000 by 4,000 pixel image. Now, that's going to be too large for us to display, and it's going to look all distorted on our screen. So what we're going to do is transform or change the resolution of the image. Uh, we can do this to scale by knowing the aspect ratio, or we can just set it to any scale that we want. So what I'll do here is actually say pygame.transform. 
dot scale, and then I'm going to put the image first as my uh, first argument, and the second argument is going to be a tuple with the new desired size of this image. Now for this image, I'm going to go with the size of 800 by 600, or we should really use our variables here, which is the width and the height. And that's because this is going to be our background image, so I want my background image to be the same size as my window. There you go. Next, we're going to do the same for our planet. So we'll copy this again, pygame.transform.scale. First argument is the image. Second argument here is going to be the size that we want. Now we have our planet size here, and this is representing the radius of our planet. So what I'm going to do is say planet underscore size multiplied by two, and then planet underscore size multiplied by two. Now, in case you haven't realized this by now, uh, the first is always the width, the second is the height or the X, Y when we eventually get to that point. Okay. Now, the reason I'm multiplying my planet size by two is because this is meant to act as the radius. So I would need to create the image to be double the size of the radius because that's kind of the diameter in the X and Y direction, right? Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but that's why I'm doubling the planet size to two here for my planet image. Perfect. Lastly, we'll define a few colors that we need. So we're going to say white is equal to a tuple. And this tuple will be 255, 255, 255, which is white. This is an RGB color code, right? Next is going to be red. Red is going to be 255, 0, 0. Uh, for RGB, you have red first, green, and then blue. If you have 0 for the other ones and kind of some value here, you're going to get some shade of red. In this case, it's the most red we can get because 255 is the maximum value for RGB. 0 is the minimum. Next, we're going to have blue. Blue is going to be 0, 0, 255. Fairly straightforward. Okay. If you wanted black, you would just have 0, 0, 0, no color at all. When you want white, you actually mix all of the colors together. That gives you white in RGB. Okay. So now we have all of our constants and all of our initial setup. We can remove that OS module. What we want to do now is just kind of see this Pygame window and be able to just interact with Pygame very simply before we start actually launching these objects around the screen. So to do that, we're going to create a function. This function will be called main. Now, what we'll do is just put pass in here for now, and we'll go down to the bottom of the screen and set up kind of this initialization, which will call the main function. So we're going to say if underscore underscore, this is two underscores here, otherwise known as dunder, name is equal equal to main. Again, two underscores, main, two underscores, then we will call main. Now, what this line does right here is it only calls this function if we run this Python file directly. Now, that's opposed to if we were to import some code from this Python file. Don't need to go through that a ton, but you always want to have this kind of in the main line of your program, and this will call some function or something that initializes the code. Again, you do that because you only want this to run if this Python file is ran directly, not if code is imported from another Python file. Okay. So inside of main here, what we'll do is we'll create a while loop. Now, a while loop will act as our game loop. Whenever we're working in Pygame, we need some loop that's running infinitely, that's checking for all of the different events and doing all of the rendering and drawing on the screen. So what I like to do is create a variable here called running and make this equal to true. I then I'm going to say while running like that. And then inside of this while loop here is the main loop, which is kind of the event loop and handles all of the stuff that might occur. Now, what we need to do in our main loop is we need to make a way to exit the loop, right? We don't want to have an infinite loop. So the way we can do that is we can write a for loop here and we can say for event in pygame dot event dot get. Now, what this is going to do here is loop through all of the different events that are occurring from Pygame, and then we can check the event and see if it's equal to a specific one, like pressing a key, pressing a mouse, pressing the X button, for example. So I'm going to say if event dot type is equal to Pygame dot, and this is going to be quit in all capitals, then we're simply going to say running is equal to false. OK, so all this means here is if we exit out of the window, so if the event type is quit, then we're going to set running equal to false. That's going to exit out of our while loop. And the last step we need down here is to say pygame dot quit. OK, saying pygame dot quit, sorry, is just going to actually close that pygame window for us. So it will exit and kind of cleanly return. All right, I know that was quite a bit of code, but let's run the code right now and just check out what our window looks like. And then we'll move on to some of the more fun stuff. So I'm going to say Python main.py. And you see that we get our gravitational slingshot effect. I can hover over X 
When I click it, it closes the window and we are good to go. OK, so let's clear, go back to our code and start writing some more stuff. So now what I would like to do is implement a clock. Now a clock is going to essentially regulate this loop and make sure it doesn't run too fast. Because right now the loop is going to run based on the clock speed of our computer. If you have a really fast CPU, it's going to run faster than if it's on a slower computer. But we don't want that. We want the simulation to be the same no matter what type of hardware we're running on. So we are going to set a clock. We're going to say clock is equal to pygame.time.clock. Notice this is above the while loop. And right at the top of the while loop here, we'll say clock.tick. And then we'll put the FPS, which is the variable we defined right here. Now, when we do this, it essentially makes it so this while loop can run at maximum 60 times per second or however much our FPS is, right? So in this case, it's 60, it could be 30, could be less than that, it just regulates the speed of the loop. Okay, great. Now that we have that, I want to draw the background onto the screen so we get something a little bit more meaningful. So there's a bunch of different ways to draw in Pygame. But to draw an image, we write the name of the window or the surface that we want to draw on. In this case, it's the window. We write dot blit. Now blit, I don't actually know what that stands for, just puts an image onto the screen. So we're going to say win dot blit. We're then going to put the name of the image asset, which in this case is BG, right? Because we have BG is equal to this. And then we're going to do comma. And we're going to put a tuple with the location of the top left hand corner where we want to display this object. Now in Pygame, we use a zero zero coordinate system uh, starting sorry at the top left hand corner of the screen. That means zero zero is the top left. So imagine VS code here is the Pygame game window right where this kind of explore icon is and my mouse is at the top left. That's zero zero. That means as I go down, my Y increases as I go to the right, my X increases. OK, so for my image, I want it to fill the entire screen. So I'm going to draw this at zero zero. And that's where we will begin drawing the image, starting at the top left hand corner of the image and drawing down and to the right. Hopefully that makes sense. But this will draw the image. Now all we need to do is say Pygame dot display dot update. Now, the way that Pygame works is we essentially can paint or draw a bunch of things to the screen in any order that we want. And as soon as we update, it actually takes whatever is there and puts it onto the screen. OK, so we have to constantly update every time we want any of the drawing changes we made to appear. That's so that we can do a bunch of drawing without rendering it first and we can render all of the drawing at once. Not sure if that makes sense to you, but we would do all of the drawing operations, then update all of the draw, drawing operations, sorry, then update, et cetera, okay? So let's go and run our code and see if our beautiful background appears. And we got an issue here, it says pygame.time has no attribute clock. That is because clock needs a capital C, my apologies. Let's make that correction and run our code and notice that we get this starry space background appearing, looking great. Okay, so let's exit out of there. Now what we want is to be able to launch objects on the screen. Now there is a few ways to do this, uh, but we're going to go with, well, obviously my approach. Now the way that we'll do this is we will say objects is equal to an array, and this will be an array that stores all of our individual objects. Now really the process will be we press our mouse down, and that'll be the location we're going to start launching the object from. Then we need to determine the velocity and direction to launch the object in, which will be another mouse press. So it's two mouse presses to create the object. That means we first need to determine, OK, what mode are we in, right? Are we selecting the velocity or are we choosing the location of the object? So we're going to define a variable here called temp object position, OK? And this is going to be equal to none. Now, this variable will store any object that we've placed onto the screen that we've not yet launched. Great. So now what we need to do is go inside of our event loop here, and we're going to start by grabbing our mouse position. So we're going to say our mouse position is equal to pygame dot mouse dot get underscore pause. This will give us the X, Y coordinate in a tuple of the location of our mouse. Now we want that because if we press onto the screen, we're going to store that location in this variable. So we now know where we're launching the object, right? So what I'll do is go inside of my event loop. And I'm going to check to see if someone has pressed the mouse down. So let's say if event dot type is equal to pygame dot mouse button down, that just means I pressed any of the mouse buttons, doesn't matter left, middle, right. Then what I will do is say my temp object position is equal to, and this will simply be the mouse position because that's where I pressed it. Now, there is a few other things we need to do here. 
But for now, what we can do is we can go ahead and actually draw the location of the mouse or of this temporary object so we see it on the screen. So what I'll do is after I blit, so after I draw my background, then I do all of my other drawing, okay? The reason I draw my background first is this essentially draws over top of anything that was already on the screen. So whenever you draw the background, you're essentially clearing the screen by putting the background on top of it, and then you can draw anything else on top of the background before you perform the update. So what we'll do here is we'll check, okay, if the temp object position exists, then what I want to do is actually draw this onto the screen so we can see it. So I'll say pygame dot draw dot circle because we're just going to draw a circle for this. We're going to draw this on the window, which is the first argument to this function. We're going to pass the color we want to draw. In this case, we want to draw red and then we're going to pass the location. Now, the location of the middle of the circle, which is what we're passing here that we want to draw is temp object position where we pressed our mouse down, right? Remember, this is going to be a tuple containing the X and Y coordinate. So if we wanted to break it down here, we could do something like 10, 10. That would mean we draw it at 10, 10. But in this case, we want to draw at the temporary object position. Next, we need to pass the uh, radius that we want to draw this object. Now, the radius is going to be the object underscore size. OK, and that's it. That's going to draw a circle for us if we have something to draw. Great. So let's go ahead and test this code out now and see what we get. And notice that as I press around the screen, my dot moves to wherever my mouse is. And there we are. OK. All right. So that is step one. The next thing that we need to do now is calculate the velocity and the direction in which we want to launch this object. So what we now need to kind of check is, OK, if we're pressing down or if we have this object placed on the screen, sorry, we want to draw a line between our mouse and the object so the user can see kind of the relative power they're going to be applying and the direction they're going to shoot the object. So what we'll do is we'll actually go here and we'll say if the temp object position exists, meaning if we've placed that first object, we're going to draw a line between the object and the mouse. So we're going to say pygame.draw.circle or sorry, not circle. What am I saying here? Dot line. We're going to pass the window. We're going to pass the color, which is going to be white. And then we're going to pass the location of both sides of the line. OK, so the two points on the line that we want to draw between. So we're going to pass the first position being the temporary object position and the second position being our mouse position. Right. And then we can pass a thickness of the line. In this case, we'll go with two pixels. So now if we run Let's bring this up here. You'll see when I press down, I get this line. OK, now I can change locations, obviously, by clicking, but it's kind of showing me the uh, the line around the object. Now it's coming from the center. And if we didn't want to see it inside of the object, we just change our drawing order. So we go here and put the circle after the line. And now notice that when I draw, the line is kind of coming out of the circle. It's not on top of the circle, which I think actually is probably going to be preferred. OK, that's great. Now that we have that, what we actually need to do is on that second press, we need to figure out all of those different components, right? OK, what is the X velocity? What is the Y velocity? We need to start moving the object, which is obviously a bit more complicated. So what we're going to do now is set up a class and this class is going to represent our object or kind of our spacecraft. This will be where a lot of the logic will lie for actually moving the object around and having that gravitational force. So we're going to say class spacecraft like this. And inside of here, we're going to do an initialization. Now for our spacecraft, we need to know the starting X and Y position on the screen. We need to know the velocity in the X direction and the velocity in the Y direction. If you're unfamiliar with velocity, that's just speed. OK, now whenever we have a 2D graphic system, we have speed in two directions or two components the X direction horizontal and the Y direction vertical. OK, so we need to break it into those two components. Lastly, we need the mass. We we'll use that when we actually apply or sorry, calculate the gravitational force. Now we need to make these all attributes of the objects. So we're going to say self dot X equal to X self dot Y is equal to Y self dot X underscore Vel is equal to X Vel self dot Y underscore Vel is equal to. Oh, I put this in the other way. OK, Y Vel or Vel X like that. OK, not sure why I wrote it that way, but that's fine. And then we'll go self dot mass is equal to mass. And in fact, this is actually going to frustrate me. So let me change this to Vel underscore X and Vel underscore Y. 
And there we go. OK, so that's everything we needed to initialize here for our spacecraft. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to write a draw method and the draw method will just draw this object on the screen in a second. We'll start moving it, but for now, we'll just draw it. So we're going to say define draw and we're going to say self and we're going to actually that's it. We don't need to take anything else in to draw. We're going to say pygame dot draw dot circle. We're going to draw this on the window. Now, this is using a global variable, not necessarily the best practice inside of a class, but in this case, that's fine. And we're actually going to have the exact same thing that we had down here pretty much uh, just up here. So we're going to say win red center of the circle is going to be self dot X self dot Y. And what else do we need to do here? We need to pick the radius, which will be the OBG underscore size like that. So not OBG, OBJ. All right. Last thing, I'm just going to round off these values here using the int function. Int is just going to strip any decimals we might have just because we'll be doing some calculations that could have some pretty large significant digits. Uh, and I want to make sure that we don't get any errors trying to render floats here. So instead, we're just kind of drawing ints. Not sure if you know what I mean there, but if we had like a large floating point value that could mess with pi games, so we're just going to convert these to int values by doing that. OK, so now we have our spacecraft. So now the point is that we want to actually create a spacecraft object every time we kind of launch one of these objects. So once we have our temporary object position, right, once we've set that, we're actually going to check if temporary object position when we're pressing the mouse button down. Now, if we already have a temporary object position, that means we've already placed an object down. So now instead of placing another one, what we'll do is we'll actually launch this object. So I'm just going to put an else here. So to launch the object, we need to figure out all of the things that we have for our spacecraft. So the X, Y, and then the velocity in the X direction, the velocity in the Y direction, and the mass. Well, we know the mass, but really these two are the ones we're looking for, the velocity in the X and the velocity in the Y. So what we can do, for now at least, is we can say that our TX, T underscore Y, standing for temporary position X, temporary position Y, is equal to temporary object position. When I do that, it will give me the X and the Y out of this tuple. Uh, that's kind of a shorthand in Python that you can use. Now what we'll do is we'll create an object. So we'll say object is equal to, and this will be a spacecraft instance. For the spacecraft, we're going to pass our TX and our TY. And for now, we're going to pass 0 and 0 for the X and Y velocity. And then lastly, here we're going to pass the mass, which is going to be the object or the ship mass. Sorry. Now we're just going to take this object and we're going to append it into objects. We'll just get a little bit of the flow working here and then we'll deal with some of the more complex math, which I think we should kind of do all at once. So we're going to say objects.append object like that. And now that this object is inside of this objects array, what we'll do is we'll actually loop through the objects array and draw all of the objects onto the screen. Eventually we'll be moving them as well, but one step at a time. So after this down here, I'm going to do another for loop and I'm going to say for event in or sorry, not for event for OBJ in objects. I'm simply going to say OBJ dot draw. Now that's because every single one of our objects is a spacecraft instance, which has the draw method. So I simply call that on all of the objects and now they get drawn. Last thing after we add the object, we'll send we'll set sorry the temporary object position to be none. We do that because now we're indicating, OK, we just went through that two step process, right? We placed the object. We figured out kind of how fast and what angle we want to launch it at. So now let's get rid of this because we already put it in the objects array. And then we have the ability to place another object going forward. Again, not fully finished yet, but that is the gist of it. OK, let's just have a look at this for now and see if I made any mistakes. So when I press and go here, Notice it stays on the screen and the line goes away. That means that this is now an object in that objects array and eventually it will be moving. Same thing here. And you can see that I can place all of these various different objects onto the screen. OK, so now comes the hard part, moving the objects. Now we can begin by moving the objects based on their X and Y velocity. But shortly, we actually want to calculate how they should be moving based on the interaction with the planet, which we'll need to draw on the screen uh, and a few other things. For now, though, let's go in spacecraft and let's define a move method. Now, for the move method, we're going to have self and we're going to take in a planet. For now, I'm going to make this equal to none, but eventually that will be actually the location of the planet. So we know how to calculate the gravitational force. 
For now, all we actually need to do is simply say our self.x is plus equal to the velocity in the x direction, and the self y is equal to the self dot vel in the y direction. That's it, right? We have a velocity in both x and y direction, so we simply apply that to our x and y and move in that direction. Boom, that's move. Now, we can very easily move our objects by going down here and saying obj or obj dot move. Perfect. Now, if I were to go here and set a velocity of something like 1, 1, you'll see that we start moving diagonally on the screen. So if I go here and run this, uh, and I place my object here, we start moving. It looks like it's moving in the direction I set, but it's really just moving one pixel down and one pixel to the right every single frame at a 45 degree angle. Okay, there you go. We now have objects moving. Now we want to move them in the direction of our mouse. What I'm going to do here is hop onto my drawing tablet and give you a brief explanation of how we can actually figure out what direction they should move in. Welcome to Physics with Tim. We're on the whiteboard and we're going to get started right away. So let's start with what information we have. Well, we have our object and for our object, we have an X1, Y1 coordinate. We have some line. This line goes to some point. This point is our mouse. Okay, for our mouse, this is X2 and Y2. Now, immediately, let's figure out what information we can derive using these two points. Well, first is the overall velocity, okay? Now, the velocity here, V, is actually a vector. The reason it's a vector is because it has a direction. Scalar values don't have a direction, vector values do. So we have some value V, which is really the distance between these two points, and that's the relative velocity that we want to launch this object at. However, that's not really helpful to us. We need to figure out what direction to move in X and in Y. So what that means is we need to expand this to a right angle triangle and we need to figure out the y component and the x component of this velocity. Now to do that using two points is actually very straightforward. We just simply need to take the difference of those two points. Okay, now the order in which we do this is important to make sure we move in the right direction. Uh, but in this case, what we can do is we can say y is simply equal to y2 minus y1 and x is simply equal to x2 minus x1. Now that's going to give us the uh, component for x and for y of the velocity, right, or the direction that we want to move in. That's it. That's literally all we need to do to get those velocities. All right. So I think that's actually going to wrap up this whiteboarding session. I just wanted to quickly show you kind of with the right angle triangles why we're doing this. Again, we have V, which is really the distance of this line. We don't actually care about V. What we care about is the components of V, which are the X and Y velocity. So we can get it doing that. We don't need any complex trigonometry. However, we will in a second need some trigonometry, which I will show you later. All right, so back onto the computer we go, and we're going to start implementing this. Now, I actually would prefer to make a function here that can create this object for us uh, so that we don't need to worry about it ourselves. So what we're going to do is have a function define create underscore ship because we're going to create a rocket ship, right? We're going to take in the location for the ship to start. And we're going to take in the mouse position. Now, inside of here, we're just going to start by breaking our components. So we're going to say TX, TY is equal to location. And we're going to say MX, M underscore Y, standing for mouse X, mouse Y is equal to mouse. Now, all we need to do is calculate the difference in these, right? So we're going to say the velocity in the X direction is going to be equal to MX. We're going to do the mouse X because this is the direction we want to go in minus, and this is going to be the T underscore X. Now we just need to make sure we do the same for Y. So we're going to say vel Y is equal to M underscore Y minus T underscore Y. Now we have the velocities. That's fine. What we want to do now is say that our object is equal to a spacecraft that starts at the position T X T underscore Y moves vel X vel underscore Y and has a mass of the ship mass. And then we will return our object. OK, that's it for creating the ship. So now we'll go down here. And rather than saying object is equal to this, we're going to actually get rid of that. We're going to say object is equal to create ship. We're going to pass the temporary object position as the location and the mouse pause as the mouse. And there you go. We now should actually have a ship that starts moving. Now, let's see if I did this correctly or not. We're going to run the code. 
and we're gonna go here and you see that we launched. Now we're moving extremely fast in whatever direction I launch it in, uh, but I will show you how we can actually scale that down because right now we're moving at the velocity, which is just equal to the distance of the line. Obviously, we don't want to move that quickly. Instead, what we actually want to do is we want to scale down the movement a little bit. So what we're going to do to do that is just go here to our velocity X and Y. We're going to put a set of parentheses and we're going to put divided by the velocity scale. And what this is going to do is just divide this by 100. So it's going to make it 100 times slower, which is going to be more reasonable for this simulation. OK, so that's it. Just divide that by the scale. Go here now. And notice I can move in this direction. I can move here. I can move whatever direction I want works in any quadrant that we're trying to move in. OK, so that's all great. However, what's going to happen is all these objects are going to be moving off the screen and still being handled. And eventually our CPU is going to get bottlenecked because we're going to have so many objects on the screen. So what we want to do is just ensure that we clean up our objects whenever they move off the screen. So we're going to go here to our objects and we're just going to make a simple check here to determine if they're off the screen. So we're going to say off underscore screen is equal to and we're just going to check all of the different ways that could be off the screen. So left, right, up and down. So to do that, we will say if the OBG, OBG, I keep saying OBG, OBJ, OBJ dot X is less than zero or the OBJ dot Y or sorry, let's do X again is greater than the width of the screen or the object dot Y is less than zero or the object of Y is greater than the height of the screen. OK, so then we'll say if off screen, then we can say objects dot remove our object. Now, just to ensure this doesn't cause any issues while we're iterating through this array, we're just going to actually make a copy here that we will iterate through. So when I do this, it just simply makes a copy of this array or this list. And now when I remove something from this list, it doesn't affect this iteration because we're iterating through a copy, not the original list. OK, so now we'll just see that these objects get removed. We actually don't need to test that. That is fine. OK, so now we know how to launch objects. Next thing we're going to do here uh, is look at creating the planet and then moving around the planet. There's actually not a lot more code that we need to write, uh, but there is just a bit of math that we're going to go over. So what I'm going to do now is make another class called planet. Now we're going to define our initialization. We're going to take in a self, an X, a Y, and a mass for the planet. Now we're just going to define these here as attributes. So self.x is X, self.y is Y, and self.mass is equal to, of course, our mass. Next, we're just going to have a draw function. So we're going to say define draw, and we're going to take in self and screen. And actually, we don't need screen. Uh, we can just leave this like this. And we'll say screen or win dot blit. And we're going to blit the planet image, OK? Because we're going to draw the image for our planet, right? And now where do we want to draw this? Well, I'm actually just going to take int of the self dot x position. Uh, and actually, I don't think I need to do that. Sorry, just second guessing myself here. I'm going to take self dot x minus the planet underscore size and self dot y minus the planet underscore size. OK, so I'm drawing the planet at this X, Y position, which will ideally be in the middle of the screen. Well, we'll set that. But the reason I'm doing this is because I'm drawing a rectangular image, but I want to draw it as if it was a circle, because if we look at this image here, it's a circle, right? So what I'm going to pass to planet is I'm going to pass the center uh, position of where I want to draw the image. Now, when I pass the center image, or the center of the image, sorry, I need to adjust that coordinate because what I'm passing here is the top left hand corner of the image. So since my image has a size of planet size times two, if I take self dot X, so whatever the position is and subtract half of the width of the image and half of the height of the image, that means we draw it perfectly centered at the X, Y position. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but that's why we need to do that. OK, so now that we have planet, we're just going to create a planet here and we're just going to draw it every flame, every frame. Sorry. So we're going to say planet is equal to planet. Let me just look at what uh, coordinates we want here. Well, actually, this is simple. We'll just take width and integer divide that by two. We'll take height and integer divide that by two. And then we'll pass in here our planet mass. Now, all we need to do is just draw our planet. You can decide when you want to draw that. I will draw it at the very end so nothing is over top of it. And I will simply say planet dot draw. So now we'll get a planet in the middle of the screen. Let's give that a test. 
and you see that we now have our planet we can start launching objects now obviously they can kind of hit the planet and they can go through them so next thing we'll do is make it so if we collide with the planet they disappear and then we'll add the gravitational pull okay so let's just quickly do if they collide with the planet so if they collide with the planet there's a few different ways we can do this but the easiest way is just to check the distance so since we're colliding with a circular object we can simply see if the distance between our point and the planet is less than the radius of the planet. If that's the case, it means it's inside of that planet. Okay. So to do that, we're going to say collided is equal to the math dot square root. And we're going to take the square root of the object dot X minus the planet dot X to the exponent two plus the object dot Y minus the planet dot y to the exponent two. If you're not familiar with this, this is the distance between two points formula. OK, so you simply just take the difference in the x coordinates, raise to the exponent two plus the difference in the y coordinates, and then you take the square root of that. And that gives you the overall distance. This is similar to how you would find the hypotenuse of a triangle given the two side lengths. Now we're going to say if off screen or collided, uh, then we will remove. And that reminds me that I need to actually make this a condition. So I need to say this is less than the planet size, which is the radius of the planet. OK, so actually we can do less than or equal to if the if our distance sorry, is less than or equal to the planet size, it means we're inside of the planet, which means we've collided. So we will remove the object from that object's list. So we no longer draw it. quickly test this out. OK, shoot at the planet and let's see if it comes out the other side. It does not because it collided and we removed it. All right, last step now is the most fun part, which is the gravitational force. Let me hop onto the drawing tablet again and explain to you how we'll do this. Welcome back to physics with Tim. Now let's dive in immediately. So we have our planet and we have some rocket ship. We know that we have some gravitational pull or effect from the planet to the ship. Now the factors that are going to affect this are one, the mass and two, the distance. OK, now the distance is going to be the more important factor. I mean, mass is going to have a big impact as well. But the further away you are, the less uh, gravitational pull you're going to have towards the planet. And this is inverse proportional. And you're going to see in the equation the distance has a massive effect on how much gravity plays a role. So we already know the mass of the two objects. What we actually need to calculate to figure out the force or the acceleration to the planet here is going to be the distance. So what right now what we're looking for is distance D. Now, once we have that distance, that's going to tell us the force or the amount of pull on this object towards the planet as a vector in that direction. Now, you'll see what I mean in one second, but let's start by writing out kind of the main thing we want to figure out here, which is the force. So the force gravitationally between two objects is equal to the following. That is going to be the gravitational constant G times M1 times M2 divided by, and this is distance squared. Okay, so we already know mass one and we know mass two. Those are the mass of the two objects. We know the gravitational constant. We can just make it up or we can use a real one. And then we need to figure out the distance and then square it. Now to figure out the distance, we just take the distance between two points on a line. We already know how to calculate that, so I'm not going to show that to you right here. So now let's imagine we've figured this out. Okay, so we actually find force, right? We get it. Boom, we figured it out. Now what we need to do, though, is we need to take this force and we need to turn this into acceleration because the force doesn't actually tell us the speed. It tells us the number of newtons, right, or whatever the unit ends up being, kilonewtons or whatever those newton units are. Um, that's the, kind of the pull from the object, but we need the acceleration. So to calculate the acceleration, we simply take the force and we divide this by the mass of the object that is moving. In this case, the mass of the object that is moving is going to be the, what is this, the spacecraft, okay? So take the force divided by the mass that gives us acceleration. However, this is acceleration in a direction. This is a vector acceleration. OK, now the reason it's vector is because, again, we have some planet, we have some space shuttle and we have some pole here and we've just figured out a. But what we need to do now is break that into its two individual components, the a x and the a y. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're using right angle triangles and we know that we always need at least two pieces of information to solve for every piece of the right angle triangle. Right now, when we're looking at this triangle, the only thing we have is A. However, this triangle is the exact same as the two points that we're calculating this acceleration for. 
that means that I'm actually able to solve for this angle theta. Once I have that angle theta, I can then figure out the two components using my right angle triangle of my acceleration. I know this might be going a little bit fast for you guys, but I know a lot of you already know this. So what we'll do to start is we'll solve for angle theta. Now to solve for angle theta, we use the right angle triangle that we began with that allowed us to determine the distance between the two points. So the right angle triangle, uh, where should I draw this? Let's draw it over here. Looks something like this. Okay. You have planet down here, you have object up here and we know these points, right? We have X two, Y two and X one, Y one. Again, we want to figure out why we simply take Y two minus Y one. We want to figure out X, X is equal to X two minus X one. So we now have the opposite and the adjacent side of the triangle. We also have the acceleration. So now that we have the opposite and the adjacent side, we're able to solve for theta. Now to solve for that, we're going to take the inverse tangent of one over the other. Now, the way I remember this in case any of you like this shortcut is something called so I'm butchering this ka toa. Okay. Now you might laugh at me for this shortcut, but I've remembered this for many, many years. This stands for sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse and tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. Now, what we need to do is we need to figure out, okay, what piece of information do we know? In this case, we know the opposite and we know the adjacent side. So what we'll do is we'll use this tangent formula. So we write out tangent. So this is tan of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. What do we want to solve though? We want to solve for theta because we know opposite and adjacent side. So how do we solve for that? Well, we have to take the inverse tangent or the arc tangent. So tan inverse of opposite over adjacent. Okay. That's all we need to do. When we take that, that is going to give us the theta or the angle. Now that we have the angle, we can now use the angle to solve for the components of our acceleration. So I'm going to just clear the screen here. And remember that this is what we have. We have our right angle triangle. Okay. We have theta. Now we know what that is and we have acceleration and we want a Y and a X. How do we solve it? Well, to solve for a Y, we simply can write out our shortcuts again, right? So, so ka toa. I'm doing this off the top of my head, by the way. So excuse any, uh, you know, delays here, but I want to solve for what is it? Let's start with a Y. Now a Y here is the opposite from this angle. So I need to find where opposite exists, but I know the hypotenuse. Now that's sine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the sine of theta is equal to the opposite, which is a Y over a, I know a, and I know theta. So I simply take sine of theta multiplied by a, and that gives me my a Y. Now I'll just shortcut this for you. I can now do the same thing with cosine to solve for my a X. Okay. So that is how we've now gone from actually figuring out the acceleration in the X and the Y direction. That's it. That's what we need to do. I know it seems a little bit complicated, but I promise you it is not overwhelming. Let's dive into the code here. Just a few lines and then we will have this project done. All right. So let's dive into the move function here and implement what I just showed you. First thing we need to calculate the distance between ourself and the planet. So we're going to say math dot SQRT. If we could spell this correctly, don't know what's happening with my typing. Now to do that. It's going to be self dot X minus the planet dot X. Okay. To the exponent two plus self dot Y minus the planet dot Y to the exponent two. We now have the distance. We now want to calculate the force. Well, the force is going to be our gravitational constant G times self dot mass times the planet dot mass divided by the distance to the exponent two. We've now calculated the force. Now we want to calculate the acceleration. Well, the acceleration is simply equal to the force divided by the mass of the object we're moving, which in this case is our self. Next, we need to figure out the angle, right? So we have the acceleration. Now we need angle theta, and then we can break it into components. So the angle is the math dot arc tangent of the planet dot Y minus the self dot Y and the planet dot X 
minus the self dot X. Now we do it in this order because this is going to give us the direction uh, correctly that we're moving in. Okay. If you did it self dot Y uh, first, like you swap these around, I would actually give you the reverse direction. So just make sure it's this direction. Okay. That's how we have to do this for the arc tangent. Now we have the angle and the acceleration. And now that we have that, we can calculate the acceleration in each direction. So we're actually going to say uh, acceleration underscore X is equal to the acceleration multiplied by the math dot cos of the angle. And we'll say the acceleration in the Y direction is equal to acceleration multiplied by the math dot sign of the angle, giving us acceleration in both directions. Now acceleration is applied to velocity. So we're going to say self dot velocity X plus equals acceleration in the X direction and self dot vel underscore Y plus equals the acceleration in the Y direction. Now we just keep this the same and we take whatever our new velocity is because again, we're accelerating, right? We're changing the velocity. It's either going up or down and we're applying that to our X and to our Y. Okay, that's it. Now you'll see that the entire simulation will just work and everything will be good. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. Uh, and we got an issue none type object has no attribute X. Okay, that is because we forgot to pass planet here to move. So we'll go down here to where we have move and we'll simply pass in our planet. And now that should work. My apologies. Let's try this now. And we got another issue math that arc tangent takes exactly one argument Two was given. Uh, okay. Ah, so the reason here is that I actually wanted to use the arctangent2 function, which just simplifies this operation a little bit for us. So just make this a tan2. All right, let's see if this is the last one. Third time's a charm, right? Come on. And there you go. We can see that now this is applied. We can launch as many objects as we would like. If they do end up colliding with the planet, they will disappear. Obviously, if you launch them kind of slowly like this, they might end up hitting the planet. They could get quite close and not hit it. Really, really kind of cool when you actually look at this and see how this works and imagine if you're dealing with real world objects. Obviously, not everything here is, you know, the best numbers you could potentially use, but you can mess around with this and change it quite a bit uh, and see kind of how the gravity is affected based on the different masses, based on the velocities, based on uh, what do you call it here, the gravitational constant that you choose. I think this is a really, really cool project. And if you stuck around until the end, give yourself a pat on the back for completing it. With that said, I'm going to wrap up the video here. This was a long recording for me. If you guys appreciated this, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I do have a few programming courses, programmingexpert.io, blockchainexpert.io. If you guys enjoy those or want to check them out, please do from the link in the description. I always appreciate that. And with that said, I will see you all in another YouTube video. Thank you.